welcome to the session titled uh, Data Warehousing Reinvented for Today's, uh, today's Needs. Uh, my name is Manan Goel. I'm a principal product manager on the Amazon Redshift team. Uh, so that's the team here at uh, AWS, uh, which is building Amazon Redshift, you know, which is one of the most popular, uh, widely used uh, cloud data warehouses uh, out there. Uh, I'll be co-presenting with Ravi uh, Pilala. Ravi is a distinguished engineer um, on data systems uh, at Intuit. Uh, and together in this session, we'll talk about uh, what we are hearing from customers um, as far as um, you know, their data warehousing journey is concerned, their needs around data and analytics is concerned. And from a Redshift perspective, what are we doing uh, to continuously innovate and bring new capabilities to the market uh, to meet those customer requirements. So uh, first of all, you know, let's start with uh, you know, a broader context in terms of what's going on with the industry, what we are hearing from customers. So you know, when we talk to customers across the board, uh, one thing um, you know, comes uh, clear is about the explosion of data. You know, all of us have experienced it. You know, there's a quote right here uh, from IDC uh, which talks about like, you know, how data is growing uh, at such a tremendous rate that you know, by the time we are done with this session, we would have generated more data uh, than you know, the data that was generated in an entire year about two decades ago. So you know, this data explosion is both an uh, opportunity as well as a challenge. It's an opportunity because you know, the more data you have, the more opportunities you have to learn about your customers, understand their behavior, learn about your business processes, optimize them, improve them, and then also learn about like, you know, all these connected uh, machines or devices or infrastructure that you have and optimize on that. Um, and it is a challenge you know, if you don't have the right systems that can help you, you know, store, process, and analyze this data at scale, give you the right performance. So that's where, you know, let's talk about what are we hearing from customers in terms of uh, requirements uh, for a state of our art data warehousing. Like, what are customers asking for, um, you know, when they talk about uh, data warehousing needs uh, in today's uh, context? So, you know, what customers tell us is like, you know, what they want in their data warehouse is the ability to store and process all kinds of data coming from all different you know, types of sources. So it could be structured data, you know, coming from your bookings, billings, backlog systems, your ERP systems, could be, you know, unstructured data such as clickstream data coming from your websites or, you know, your internet of things, uh, devices and things like that. Could be coming from, you know, mobile devices or, you know, your business systems or places like that. What customers want is the ability to bring all of that together and process it, analyze it at scale. Uh, what they also want is a, a simple to use system where you know they don't have to worry about the infrastructure they don't have to worry about you know how to stand data warehouses how to scale data warehouses you know it's as easy as pressing a button doing a few clicks and having things up and running have them scale up or down as needed and that's where like you know uh, scaling uh, these uh, data warehouses seamlessly is also pretty important you know we talked about the explosion of data you know the data deluge that's going on uh, so what customers tell us is they want, you know, their analytic systems to automatically scale without much manual intervention. So that's also, you know, one of the key important uh, needs that we hear from customers. Uh, the fourth thing is like, you know, customers want all these capabilities with pay, uh, with pay as you go pricing. You know, they don't want to break the bank. Uh, you know, as with, with the explosion of data, they don't want systems, you know, where cost also increases linearly. You know, they want cost-effective systems which can efficiently store this data, process this data, analyze this data. Um, you know, and then you know, definitely they want systems which are which give them top price performance. You know, process the queries extremely fast, deliver results extremely quickly at the right right price point. And and finally, it's about you know systems which can help customers do different styles of analytics you know not just your traditional business intelligence dashboards but also things like you know predictive analytics for example being able to you know uh, forecast things being able to predict what will happen in the future do real time analytics you know reduce the time it takes to collect data analyze it and take actions on it so they they want you know those capabilities as well 
And, and finally, you know, the, the cherry on the cake or the icing on the cake is customers want these capabilities uh, as fully managed services in the cloud. So they can easily scale up and down, you know, they can pay only for what they need. Uh, and basically like, you know, have really high performance uh, data warehousing systems. So that's where uh, Amazon Redshift comes in. Um, you know, for um, Amazon uh, Redshift, you know, uh, what we give you basically with Redshift is a easy to use, fast, scalable data warehouse uh, that can scale from terabytes to petabytes to meet all your business analytics needs. And as far as Redshift is concerned, you know, there are four key areas uh, where we are investing in, you know, based on the previous slide that you saw around the requirements that customers have. In order to meet those requirements, there are, you know, four main areas that we are investing in. The first one is easy analytics for everyone. So where we want to make sure that, you know, we take away all the muck around getting started with data warehousing, scaling data warehouses, operating them, managing them. We want to make sure like, you know, data warehousing is easy, not just for, you know, your technical users, but also non-technical users like business analysts or line of business users. The second area where we are investing in is giving you the ability to analyze all your data. So break free from data silos, go across transactional databases, go across data lakes, uh, go across other data warehouses, even third party data sets and analyze all that data quickly. Um, the third thing is, you know, price performance. That has been like, you know, our mantra from day one, where, you know, we'll talk more about what we did in this area and how we launched Redshift. But, you know, giving you the right price performance uh, so you can cost effectively analyze all this, you know, the big data or the data that we are seeing. Um, and the final thing about Redshift is uh, security and governance. You know, we believe security and governance is job uh, zero for us. You know, everything starts uh, with security and governance in mind. So you want to make sure that, you know, we give you capabilities like network isolation, authentication, authorization, encryption to, you know, ha to have a 360 degree view of security for your data warehouses. So let me also, you know, walk you through a little bit of a history around uh, Redshift in terms of, you know, how we got started, you know, what capabilities we launched in the market and how the capabilities have evolved uh, over the years. Uh, so the journey with the Redshift uh, has really been about uh, listening to customers, starting with customers, working backwards from customer requirements, and, and building capabilities that really help uh, address you know, the needs the customers have around you know, really managing the volume, variety, velocity, and veracity of the data. So you know, we announced uh, Redshift in 2012, uh, you know, it's been about uh, 10 years, so, you know, it's the 10th year anniversary of uh, Redshift. Uh, but, you know, when we announced uh, Redshift in 2012, you know, what we heard from customers is, you know, the existing systems or the solutions that they had for data warehousing were really not uh, scalable and performant, were not able to help them manage, you know, the, the big data evolution that they were seeing. So that's where, you know, we announced Redshift as the first cloud data warehouse um, in the market segment, uh, which gave you, you know, unmatched uh, price performance. Redshift came out, uh, you know, at the price performance point of $1,000 per terabyte, uh, which was unheard in the industry. Like, if you look at the other solutions in that era, you know, the, that figure used to be like thousands of dollars per terabyte. And Redshift was the first data warehouse that came, that launched in 2012. Uh, as a massively parallel processing data warehouse that leveraged the advantages of cloud around elasticity, scalability, and gave you a really uh, nice price performance uh, in terms of managing this vast data that you were seeing. You know, fast forward a couple of years, uh, what customers told us is that, you know, as this, the different variety of data that they were gathering kept on increasing, they were adopting more and more uh, of data lakes, S3-based data lakes, Amazon S3-based data lakes, uh, to store, process, analyze this data in you know, open source formats like JSON and Parquet and Avro and things like that. So that's where you know, we launched um, a capability called Redshift Spectrum, uh, which gave you the ability to natively go across this data in S3 and analyze it at scale. 
you know, this was uh, you know a key capability in terms of being able to do serverless analytics on top of uh, data sitting in S3 data lakes, and you know, Spectrum gave you that. Um, you know, customers also told us that you know they wanted to uh, separate uh, storage and compute. Like you know, one of the things uh, you know what traditionally the data warehouses were built with this architecture where storage and compute were tightly coupled. But as you know, we saw the explosion of data. Customers wanted to separate those things, you know, so they can scale them independently. So that's where we launched uh, you know our RA3 instance family a couple of years ago which really separates storage and compute and helps you scale you know, those, uh, both of those things independently of each other. Uh, customers also told us that they wanted elasticity you know, in terms of being able to scale the capacity of their data warehouses. So we launched a capability called concurrency scaling where you, know, you can horizontally scale your data warehouses by adding additional node and you know, this is basically a capability where you can scale up and scale down. You know, it goes bi-directionally. And finally, like, you know, customers also told us that they wanted to break free from data silos. They wanted to go across, you know, data sitting in data lakes as well as uh, transactional databases like Aurora and RDS. So we launched a capability called Federated Query where, you know, you can go directly against data sitting in, you know, relational databases like Aurora, or RDS and query that data in place. Uh, fast forward another couple of years, like you know, um, last year, you know, what customers started telling us is that you know they wanted uh, more uh, of data sharing type capabilities, so they can share data between Redshift clusters. That's where we launched a capability called Redshift Data Sharing. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But you know, it, it gives you the ability to share data across your Redshift clusters, within account, across account. Uh, what we also heard from customers is the, the need to do machine learning on the data in their data warehouses. So we launched a capability called Redshift ML, which integrates with SageMaker and gives you the ability to use SQL to build your models, train your models, deploy your models, uh, do machine learning from within the data warehouse itself. And then there were like you know other asks around simplifying the user experience. So you know we launched a capability called Query Editor there. If you haven't used it, I'll definitely encourage you to go try it out. Like a really interesting capability in terms of you know browsing your schemas, running your queries, visualizing the data, and it comes natively from Redshift, you know, without any extra charge. Uh, we also launched a capability called Aqua to improve performance for you. So where we use hardware components like FPGAs to you know, accelerate certain type of analytic queries. Again, you know, let's talk about what's going on this year. So, you know, what we heard from customers was the need to, you know, when we launched data sharing, they also asked us for capabilities to share Redshift data across third-party providers as well. So that's where we launched a capability called AWS uh, Data Exchange Integration with Redshift. And we'll talk a little bit more about it because, but it gives you the ability to share, consume third-party data in your data warehouses, Redshift data warehouses, access them as Redshift data shares. Uh, what we also heard was, you know, a need from you uh, or customers to simplify data warehousing. You know, take away the muck around launching data warehouses. So we launched um, in preview uh, serverless, Redshift serverless. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about it as well. We heard needs around uh, real-time analytics, so we launched uh, streaming ingestion support in Redshift with uh, Kinesis in preview, uh, more capabilities in coming in this area. And then also, you know, there were asks around security and you know, identity, uh, support for more identity providers and things like that. We continue to innovate in that area. So as a result of it, you know, uh, we have seen tremendous success with uh, Redshift. You know, it remains the most uh, widely used cloud data warehouse. Tens of thousands of customers today uh, use Redshift to analyze exabytes of data every day. You, know, you can see like there are customers across pretty much every industry, you know, from gaming to financial services to healthcare. Uh, it's been pretty gratifying in terms of what we are seeing as far as the success of Redshift is concerned uh, with customers. So let's, uh, let's take a step back and you know, dive deeper into each of these four areas that I talked about, uh, you know, where we are making investments with Redshift, and talk about like, you know, some of the key capabilities that we are bringing out in these areas. 
which are really uh, helping you, you know, break down data silos, bring together data in a single place, analyze it, um, do machine learning on top of it, and make that data available to, you know, the different personas within your organization. So we'll start with price performance. Um, you know, as I said, uh, price performance has uh, remained a cornerstone of Redshift from day one. You know, when we re launched Redshift in 2012, uh, you know, the, 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 the founding principle for Redshift is to give you the best price performance. And that's where, you know, things like $1,000 per terabyte, you know, really helped uh, customers. You know, we have continued to make investments in this area, uh, you know, I'm really happy to say uh, that, you know, today uh, when we run benchmarks, you know, using these benchmarks like TPC DS and TPC Edge, what we find is like Redshift delivers up to 3x better price performance than any other alternative systems that are out there. You know, there are a lot of capabilities that Redshift provides in terms of, you know, horizontally scaling uh, the clusters, vertically scaling the clusters. So things like, you know, concurrency scaling, for example, where we can automatically, as workloads increase, we, should, we see more concurrent queries and users, we can automatically add uh, more clusters to horizontally scale your data warehouse environment. You can also use capabilities like elastic resize and classic resize to vertically scale your clusters, go from, you know, smaller instance type to a bigger instance type. Uh, for specific, you know, query workload optimization, Redshift has capabilities like automatic workload management, where you can define, you know, you can create query management rules and decide what resources, you know, your query should have and, you know, how to prioritize the query and get them the right resources and all. Uh, so, yeah, definitely, like, you know, really exciting to see, um, you know, how we are, you know, delivering price performance in this area up to 3x uh, better price performance than anything else that's available in the industry. You know, there are a couple of links here on this slide. Uh, you know, I invite you to visit those links. You know, if you want to run these benchmarks, we have run these benchmarks, but the data sets and the queries for these benchmarks are available for you as well. They're available on GitHub. So if you want to test it in your environment, you know, it's pretty easy to try these things out and test it. Another key thing that we have done with Redshift is, you know, in this area of short query acceleration, where we deliver up to eight, eight times more throughput for shorter queries, queries that run in, you know, less than a second or a few seconds, compared to any other data warehouse. And this is really important, like, you know, because if you think about what's going on in industry, you know, a lot of customers are building applications on top of Redshift. Uh, and embedding Redshift for em uh, embedded analytics within their applications, whether, you know, it's a payment processing application or a banking application or, you know, different kind of applications. So there you see a lot of these, you know, as customers build uh, internet scale applications, which are being used by like, you know, thousands of users. And you see a lot of these short running queries. And, you know, this feature that we launched with Redshift around short query acceleration, which gives you like, you know, 8x more throughput than any of the data warehouses out there is really useful for building those kind of, you know, uh, applications that use embedded analytics in them. We also launched capabilities like materialized views, you know, where um, if you see repeatable patterns in your uh, data warehouses, you know, let's say business intelligence dashboards, which have similar kind of queries, what we can do is, you know, we can create materialized views which can persist those results, you know, do all those complex joins, persist those results, and then we have capabilities where, you know, the queries can be automatically rewritten to use those materialized views. You know, we also launched a capability called automatic materialized views where we, you know, monitor your workload patterns and automatically create these materialized views, uh, which is available in preview as well. You know, it gives you, um, you know, up to 10x better uh, performance on, on your queries. And then finally coming to the cost, like, you know, even with all these capabilities, we have tried to build a system that always remains cost effective for you. So, you know, you can have up to 75% uh, of savings with capabilities such as reserved instances, you know, you can go with one year or three year reserved instances, um, or, you know, other features like pause and resume where you can pause the compute on your cluster and not having to pay, uh, you know, for compute when, when, when the data warehouse is not, not in use. 
So overall, like, you know, this remains a key investment area for us. We'll continue to bring on new capabilities in this area, but, you know, definitely um, love for you to try the data warehouse, see, you know, what kind of uh, capabilities, features, benefits you are seeing, you know, with all the work that we are doing around performance. The second area of investment for, uh, for us is uh, to make it uh, easy for you to analyze all your data. What we want to do with Redshift and what we have done with Redshift is really broken down data silos. Uh, so you can go across, you know, from within Redshift to your transactional databases, to your S3 data lakes, to other data warehouses, and even third-party data stores, uh, third-party Redshift clusters, and access all of that data in place. So in this area, we have built capabilities like federated query, for example, which helps you go natively from Redshift to you know, Aurora, RDS, run queries there, get results back in Redshift, and process that data together. We have, you know, we talked about a capability called Spectrum, where you can go against you know, data sitting in S3, leave the data in place without having to do any ETL, and, and do analytics on top of that data. Uh, we also launched a capability, you know, we talked about data sharing, AWS data exchange integration, where you can access third-party data sitting in, you know, uh, a provider's Redshift cluster and run queries on that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then turning it around and, like, you know, from an analytic perspective, we want to give you capabilities around, you know, we have given you capabilities around SQL analytics. We also added machine learning, so you can do machine learning-based analytics. And then Redshift also easily integ integrates with your uh, BI and dashboarding and analytics tools using you know, ODBC, JDBC connectors. So if you're using you know, any of the third-party BI tools, whether it's like Tableau or you know, Microsoft Power BI, you, know, you can continue to uh, use those against uh, Redshift. So, um, you know, I want to drill down a little bit more on this, you know, key capability that we launched last year, which is around data sharing. You know, this is, uh, this is one of the areas where, you know, we are seeing a lot of interest from customers, and what customers are telling us is, you know, they want, to, uh, they want easy access uh, to data in other Redshift clusters. They want this access to be instant, granular, secure, and without moving any data around. So that's where we launched this capability called Redshift data sharing last year, which really makes it easy for you to access data sitting in other Redshift clusters without you know, moving or copying that data around. It's granular, it's secure, you can decide you know, what data people should have access to. And it, it opens up a variety of uh, really interesting use cases, you know, whether it's around sharing or collaboration, you know, one team being able to see data in another, another team's uh, cluster and you know, do, do get much richer insights and do you know, drive business decisions on the basis of that. So you know, from a use case perspective, this is pretty interesting in terms of like, you know, being able to power use cases like you know, sharing and collaboration. You know, sales can now look at a marketing cluster data warehouse. Marketing can look into sales data warehouse, and they can see like, you know, if marketing launches a promotion, like a you know, discount on something, they can see what's the effect as far as the orders are concerned in the sales data warehouse, and, and vice versa. So pretty interesting use case around you know, sharing and collaboration. Other things like workload isolation, you know, this data sharing also gives you the ability to move away from single monolithic clusters, which are, you know, running multiple workloads to, you know, a more simplified and performant architecture with smaller clusters, which are workload specific. So they don't, you know, um, step on each other's um, queries or workloads, if you will. And then finally, chargeability, like, you know, if you want to have a, data warehouse deployment where you want to charge different teams based on that, you know, it gives you that capability as well. So, so this is, you know, this is the area where we continue to make investments in. We launched it last year, you know, now we have both cross-account, cross-region data sharing available as well. So, you know, if you want to look, uh, you know, share data across Redshift clusters within your organization, gives you a really good capability. I definitely encourage you to try it out if you haven't yet uh, tried it. Another thing that we did with data sharing is, you know, taking it to the next level in terms of giving you access to third-party data sets as well. So what customers have been telling us is that, you know, uh, they want us to simplify how they onboard third-party data. So that's where what we did is we integrated Redshift data sharing with uh, AWS Data Exchange, 
which is a marketplace for data sets. And you know, in the AWS data exchange, there is a concept of uh, providers and subscribers. So providers can take the data in their Redshift cluster, package it as a data product, and have you know, pricing and subscription terms around it. And then subscribers can come in, search for these data sets, subscribe to it, and get ac instant granular secure access to you know, providers uh, Redshift cluster with data in it. Pretty interesting capability. We're seeing a lot of adoption with it. You know, I have an example of a food and beverages customer, for example. You know, this is, uh, this is a fast food chain, a global fast food chain. And, and what they're doing is they're using this capability to onboard uh, weather data from a third party uh, data provider. And based on this data, now they are able to do, you know, better order forecasting, figure out like, you know, if, if, if temperatures are really rising in a reason, they can stock up with more ice creams and milkshakes and things like that. So, you know, again, uh, uh, many customers told us that, you know, they onboard third party data. And traditionally, the process has been like, you know, a manual process where you land data on S3 and then you copy it into Redshift, do a lot of ETL and all. But with this capability, it simplifies all of that, takes away the mark. Because you, like, you know, a provider can list their data products, subscribers can just look at it, and they get access to a Redshift uh, cluster with data in it, and it's all live and transactionally consistent. All right, so the third pillar that I wanted to talk about is uh, easy analytics for everyone, where you know, we are uh, really making a lot of investments in terms of simplifying how to get started with data warehouses, how to run data warehouses, how to manage data warehouses. So in this area, you know, one of the biggest announcements that we made at uh, reInvent last year was uh, Redshift Serverless. So the idea with Redshift Serverless is basically the easy button for getting started with data warehouses. What it really does is helps you get started with data warehouses in a few clicks. You know, you can, you don't, it takes away all the muck around, you know, deciding which instances to use, how much memory to use, how much CPU to use, how many number of instances you need. All you need to do with serverless is go to the console. You know, if you select the defaults, you can get started with data warehouses in, in a minute. You can have a serverless instance of a data warehouse in a minute. And you can spend your time on high value activities like building your applications, loading data, running queries. Whereas all the muck around, you know, provisioning these data warehouse clusters, scaling compute for the data warehouse up or down, tuning the data warehouse, Schema management, you know, patching, backups, recovery are all managed by us. So, you know, this is a really great capability. We launched it at Redshift as a, uh, we launched it at reInvent, as I said. The adoption for this capability has been pretty tremendous. Uh, you know, we're really working hard to get it out in GA. But if you haven't tried Redshift Serverless today, I would strongly encourage you to go to the Redshift page on aws.com try out Redshift Serverless. There is also a free credit, uh, a $500 free credit for you to try out Redshift Serverless. So strongly encourage you to go try it out. In terms of use cases, you know, there are, uh, you know, uh, it gives you a lot of capabilities around, you know, easy analytics where you don't have to worry about like, you know, how do I start a data warehouse? How do I run a data warehouse? So, you know, from a use case perspective, serverless Redshift is really good for, you know, when you're looking for easy analytics, you know, your business analyst, line of business users want, you know, the ability to run, scale, manage data warehouses. You, it's also a really interesting um, use case around, you know, when you have variable and uh, spiky workloads. So what happens, like, you know, if you have variable or spiky workload, like, you know, let's say, you know, uh, a lot of queries come in at the same time or a lot of users hit the system at the same time. It's really hard to uh, size the system in terms of, you know, how much instances you need, memory you need, CPU you need. Like if you size your data warehouse based on the maximum workload or the peak, you know, what might happen is like rest of the time when the system is not being used, you are basically over, over provisioning and wasting on resources. On the other hand, like, you know, if you under provision, and you know, uh, size it according to you know when you don't need enough capacity. Then you know when spikiness come in, when more users come in, you know they'll experience a delay in terms of getting their request met. 
So that's where like, you know, serverless works in really, really well because, you know, compute is automated in serverless, scaling is automated in serverless. It automatically monitors the query patterns and depending upon the workload, it will automatically scale up, scale down. It can scale down all the way to zero. So if you have no queries coming in, it goes in the pause state and you, know, you don't pay anything for compute in that case. So really good uh, use case there. Periodic workloads, you know, if your kind of data warehouse is not continuously getting used, you know, 24 by seven, my, uh, that's a pretty good use case for serverless as well because as I said, it goes in the pause state, you know, when, when no, no queries are coming in and you don't pay for anything. Another area we have been investing in is uh, autonomics in the data warehouse where we want to make it easy for you to you know, manage the data warehouse. So you know, serverless makes it easy to run, scale the data warehouses, but we also want to give you capabilities around autonomics where we use you know, capabilities like machine learning to um, automate uh, how schema is designed, how you know, queries are run, um, and you know, give you more uh, performance and capabilities there. So a couple of things in that area, you know, from a schema design, schema optimization perspective, we launched capabilities like uh, automatic table optimization, um, you know, auto sort and distribution keys. Uh, we also launched auto vacuum delete in that area. Uh, smart defaults is another way where we can decide, you know, based on the data loads or when you create your tables, how to, you know, how to organize data in a distributed system using the right sort distribution keys and all. You know, we talked about materialized views as a way of you know, optimizing your queries. We also have capabilities like Redshift Advisor, which can look at your data warehouse and analyze the workloads on the data warehouse and make recommendations in terms of how to you know, further improve the performance of your data warehouse. And then definitely there's capabilities like auto workload management where you can decide you know, what resources the query should have, create queues, and you know, allocate resources accordingly. So, you know, we continue to make a uh, lot of investments in this area, you know, trying to make data warehousing easy to get started with, scale data warehouses seamlessly, you know, Redshift, as you know, is fully managed, so you don't have to worry about, you know, all the muck around backups, recovery, patching and all, we take care of that for you. You know, we've also been launching visualization capabilities in Redshift capabilities like Query Editor, where you can, you know, within, from within Redshift, you know, this is a free tool, by the way. You can go to the console, or it has its own URL, browse your schema, run queries, and then also visualize the results as charts if you want. Uh, we have capabilities like Data API, which makes it easy for you to connect to Redshift. You don't have to do connection management, things like that. And then finally, like, you know, from an analytics perspective, uh, Redshift gives you a variety of different ways of looking at your data. You know, spatial analytics is another capability that's natively integrated in Redshift. And then you also get like, you know, all the great, uh, you know, SQL capabilities, machine learning capabilities and things like that. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about is, you know, keeping your data secure. So as we said, like, you know, from day one, uh, you know, we believe that security and compliance is integral to, you know, how you store, process, and analyze your data. So, you know, all the security capabilities are integrated, available in Redshift. There, there's no extra charge for any of this, and we basically provide a comprehensive 360-degree security view, you know, all the way from authentication, authorization, to encryption, to, you know, compliance, uh, support for different compliance regimes. So, you know, from an authentication perspective, we integrate with uh, identity and access management. We also support ID Federate, you know, so you can use third-party authentication services like Azure Active Directory or, you know, Okta or things like that. You know, access control, we provide uh, column-level security, role-based access control. You know, you have encryption, you have SOC compliance and other things built into the system. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ravi to talk about uh, Intuit's journey as far as data analytics is concerned and what they're doing with Redshift. Thank you, Manan. Um, good morning, everyone. Oh, a lot. Right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm delighted to be with, you, be with you, and I'm excited to share into its uh, multi-year journey to powering Intuit Analytics with Redshift. 
We are a purpose-driven, value-driven company. Our mission, powering prosperity around the world. That's the single reason we show up to the work every single day to do the incredible things for our customers. We are a fintech company. We provide software and services for the uh, consumers, small businesses, and self-employed. Our flagship products are TurboTax. Hope everyone done with taxes two days back. Tax day is there. Yeah, enjoyed, I guess. And uh, QuickBooks, it is an accounting software, Mint. You can manage your finances. Credit Karma and MailChimp. Okay, Intuit journey started, before I go into analytics side of it, I Intuit journey started 38 years ago. Uh, at a small kitchen table, our, co our founder, Scott Cook, observed uh, wife struggling to balance the family checkbook. He thought to himself that there is a better way to manage this. At that moment, that I, for, uh, idea came into a life, and that is a Quicken is a product is born out of that. And the mission to a company into it was born. During the last three uh, platform shifts, as Manan was started saying that data was growing drastically, the same story here, there's nothing new, the data from grow in our side from GBs to terabytes. At the same time, you can, you can imagine, right, we have started capturing more and more clickstream data, more personalization, more uh, uh, providing the services which customers likes. That information is going drastically up. And then if you take an age as a feature, and that featureization in the AI world is turned into a bunch of other features. So that's the way the data is increased. We moved to AWS in 2019. It's a kind of a lift and shift, and we didn't finish the journey there yet. And we, last year around October, we finished uh, powering our analytics with the AWS Redshift. So I'm clicking down a little bit how the analytics journey inside Intuit is transformed over the years. Um, it's no surprises. Um, it's a, all the uh, analytics starts with the business unit silos reporting uh, on top of their application servers where we have um, RDBMS and OLTPs and then reporting solutions built and then those famous Excel spreadsheets and to analyze the data and all that stuff. Um, there is a limited data visibility there. Then Intuit started, uh, purchased the first MPP appliance. Um, it have, the focus there was to basically centralize subset of the data. Not all data is available and we hit the wall immediately with the performance issues, scale up, scale out, and then cost was increasing up there. And then we built a 200 node Hadoop cluster in our own in-house data center, Quincy data center, and tried to centralize all the data there. Uh, the main, uh, is it's a mixed reaction. The basic tooling is Hive to access the data. And uh, initially there was a struggle to manage the data parity between the the source systems to the data lake, but we made, nailed it down towards the end. And uh, it's a, uh, some users likes those console, uh, the black console terminal, high windows to query the data. Then we adopted a, another MPP, which is uh, hosted in-house, it is not an appliance. And uh, it was like uh, widely accepted by our data workers and it started uh, uh, the usage of that growing drastically up. What that end up is we try to, the data got replicated uh, between the data lake and the, uh, the MPP here. The footprint grow, growing up and then people started using 
it started adding more and more nodes on a side, and then we started hitting the performance issues and our DBS trying to do tune the performance queries based on the table structure and access patterns. And it reached a state we are not able to do much about that. And then we started controlling the resource pools, when the users can able to execute what and all that stuff. That's the time, that's the around time we have to migrate to AWS uh, cloud environment. All the applications front ends already migrated by that time. It's our chance to migrate to AWS. We sat down with AWS professional services, solution architects, and our architecture team and tried to nail down how do we wanted to solve this problem. Uh, if you read about it, AWS migration six hour strategy, we picked first two ones, which basically, uh, first one is uh, relocated, which is a lift and shift. And then we wanted to uh, do a replatform. As part of the lift and shift, we migrated to the cloud. And um, the main focus there is basically position ourselves to migrate to a redshift. And then another one is move the petabytes of data from in-house data center to a cloud. That was, there is not much benefit to the uh, data workers in this. It is the same thing in in-house and then same thing in AWS. So this diagram shows uh, how it looks like after we did the uh, lift and shift to AWS. If I come from left side to right side, um, if I classify all the different databases, source data sources, we have the data generated from. There are a lot of application microservices built on top of RDBMS and OLTPs. The, and then we have a lot of behavioral data coming through, through a click stream data and the domain events coming there. And then a lot of third party data also coming from the different sources. That's being ingested into our data lake. Here the data lake for us in AWS is a high meta store and uh, uh, S3 bucket, we store all the data into S3 buckets, it's compressed, snappy compressed parquet files. The data is being streamed or bashed based on the use cases from data, uh, different sources to a data lake. And then towards the right side, that's what I'm going to focus on for the next five minutes is um, we try to move the uh, data to an MPP through a EMR cluster. That's the first time we started exploring the EMR cluster and how do we use it, and we are getting familiarized with that cluster. And as I said, the MPP, the plot of processing was happening inside an MPP itself. And then data workers are accessing through MPP or EMR clusters. There is not much change from in-house to AWS after the lift and shift other than uh, we started leveraging the EMR cluster here. With respect to a couple of numbers, how big is the MPP is there in the AWS side before replatforming it? It's like we have around 50,000 tables uh, and uh, 2.5 petabytes of data and 10,000 ETLs we are managing. It's engineering only ETLs and 500,000 queries a day being executed on the MPPs. It's a 100 node clusters, overall all the clusters together. And we have a, a, around 2,000 data workers are accessing the MPP on daily basis. This is a phase two, basically we re-platformed it after migrating to AWS and it took a, a 18 months journey for us to re-platform it. The focus here is the left side remains the same, the right side has got changed. The focus here is we wanted to first separate the processing out of the MPP, in this case Redshift. The ETL processing we have done into three different uh, tools, per, per, fit, per, fit for per, purpose tools, sorry. Um, most of the processing we have done shifted to EMR clusters. 70% uh, is done through EMR Spark uh, processing. And then AWS view, whenever we have to deal with some of the third party APIs while we do the processing. And then the Amazon Redshift ETL cluster. This is a savior for us, the Amazon Redshift ETL cluster. We have a bunch of uh, data loads 
which are uh, very huge. And when we try to do the same processing on the EMR cluster with 100 plus nodes, Spark processing, it was taking two and a half hours to three hours a day. And that's not okay for us because we are missing our SLS because of that three hours period. So we immediately tried with Redshift ETL cluster and it was doing boom, it's 15 minutes it took. We have to go back six months to update a lot of data processing and complex things were happening there. We asked our data workers, if you need to access the data lake directly, use AWS Athena for that. And you don't have to use um, that uh, EMR clusters. That is another big win for us. And then, as usual, the Redshift reporting is basically we made a conscious decision to only ingest the Redshift inside the Redshift ETL reporting cluster, the generated insights, not the raw data. Raw data stays in the data lake, and then with the generated analytics data only will be living in the reporting cluster. So but with this one, the uh, footprint got changed drastically inside the reporting cluster. The tables, 50,000 tables to 10,000 tables because we didn't move the raw data. Raw data stays in the uh, data lake itself. And then data size, 2.5 petabytes to 400 terabytes. And then queries uh, changed from 500,000 500, to 130,000. Um, users remains the same. I'll click down how the Redshift uh, uh, helped us, some of the features helped us to get there. So we did a lot of re-platforming re and restructure and moving, moving all the things around. One is uh, Redshift managed storage. As I mentioned, that data volume is growing day by day, and how do we make sure that we don't have to worry about the data volume anymore? This is a big savior, and another big thing in the Redshift uh, manage storage is um, hot storage and a cold storage. Frequently accessed data is, uh, is kept inside the cache and then non-frequently used in the cold storage. So in that way, the performance also very high when we are accessing the most recent data. Because of the RA3 uh, instances, the data sharing was made easy for us. So uh, the way we have done uh, our Redshift cluster, we applied a domain-driven approach. Basically, we have our four different domains, uh, primary Redshift clusters are there. One for uh, consumer group, which basically deals with the tax data and uh, mint data. And the second one is the small business accounting, QuickBooks data and around that stuff. And then now care, marketing, sales, it's common for both. And last but not the least, the uh, risk and fraud, which basically manages across the things if anything going wrong. Now, the, uh, our case was in earlier situation, we have to move the data between these uh, old MPPs clusters to one MPP cluster to do the cross-platform and cross-analytics. Now, that made this uh, data sharing made our job easier. We don't have to move the data anymore. We don't have to manage the ETLs anymore. If it is in one Redshift cluster, boom, it is available for other clusters. Obviously, we make sure that uh, the compliance needs are taken care. We are not sharing every data and everything to with all the clusters. Whatever the data it is shareable, we shared across these clusters. The next one is Redshift Spectrum. As I mentioned earlier, right, uh, our data is stored in the data lake in uh, compressed parquet files, snappy compressed parquet files. Now, they, we didn't move that data to a Redshift cluster. What if the data workers need to join the generated insights with the raw data, lake data? The Redshift spectrum is a savior for us. So we they simply, we enable those, class, the, those tables through a Redshift spectrum and then they can join seamlessly th this data. From the cost standpoint, we paid a, a little bit more interest on the different access patterns, and then in, we partition the data in our data lake accordingly, so th we don't have to worry about the cost while using the Redshift spectrum. Concurrency scaling. It's, uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, the Manan was mentioning, right? So, 
we need the scaling data needs changes. ETL change, ETLs uh, run at a different times, and the users go into the cluster at the same time, and a lot of things are happening in the same cluster. Uh, this is a last one week. I'm not sure you guys are able to see that in a big screen, but uh, this is the last week I took a snapshot how the scaling is working in our own one of the Redshift cluster. This is the risk uh, cluster. This is the kind of a scaling is happening. And the last one is an elasticity. So we wanted to scale up the clusters, uh, the change the instance types before the season and then bring down the instance types after the season so that we can a little bit better manage the, our uh, uh, tax season or the holiday season loads. We are not scaled it down though. Uh, we scaled up last tax season and uh, holiday season. We'll need to try that one more time after this season is ended yesterday or no, two days back. How does that help into it? Um, so when we measured before and after our data workers, the data workers saved at least one hour a day doing the unnecessary things like data movement or all those activities. So just think about it. Uh, every data worker saved their one hour a day not doing the things what they're used to do in the in-house data center. It's like we have 2,000 data workers. I think 2,000 hours a day is being saved. Uh, and then SLA, this is one of the um, best story for us. SLAs are critical for us, especially when it comes for uh, measuring the business performance on day-to-day -day basis. And when we are at the in-house data center, uh, our SLAs is around 9.30. And uh, uh, we reached, uh, um, when we, after replatforming, um, we are completing around 6.30, some signed 5.30. It's we actually completing far ahead. There is nothing changed, by the way. It's, it's exactly the same. The, we are meeting our SLS three hours before. One of the business users asked me, what you guys did, why you guys are made that, like how do you made that three hours before you are completing the same, same jobs? Uh, I said, okay, nothing. We just did the replatforming, that's it. And Redshift is taken care of most of our headaches. That said, so there are other benefits which Manan has already mentioned. Uh, I would point out no-code no integrations, security, and compliance. These are really helped us to uh, nail down the uh, many aspects. Like for example, uh, our streaming services, Kafka data comes into, uh, sits into a data lake directly, and then we don't need to write an ETL code or not, not a single line of a code use Spectrum to join that data, data with insights. Uh, that kind of integrations were made our job easier. That is not the case with the old MPP. Uh, that said, um, uh, we are not stopping here. We, have, uh, uh, we are planning to uh, adopt the Redshift serverless ETL for uh, serverless um, uh, feature for our ETL processing for those crazy ETLs what we are mentioned about. We wanted to use the serverless feature. At the same time, the federated query options. Uh, federated query is basically, we are more, more and more inspired by the data sharing that enabled us, like we don't want to move the data, let the data sitting wherever it, wherever it is located. We just wanted to query and enable the data workers to seamlessly access the data much faster way. Uh, that said, I, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, AWS Professional Services and uh, Solution Architects and our Intuit colleagues uh, to make this uh, journey possible. And uh, thank you. Right. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, really nice story. Uh, so, just uh, just to wrap things up, like you know, uh, hopefully um, you got a good view in terms of you know how uh, we are basically continuing to innovate with Redshift. You know, we've already delivered a number of capabilities to help you better manage your data. You know, do analytics at scale with performance and cost effectively. Uh, it still remains day one for us. Uh, so you know, 
uh, actively looking, really excited about you know what the future holds. Uh, you know, Ravi's story was quite inspirational in terms of what customers are uh, able to do with Redshift and you know our uh, AWS analytics uh, and database services. Um, you know, we have a couple of next steps here for you. Um, you know, if you are interested in learning more about Redshift, I would definitely encourage you to visit the AWS the Redshift page on AWS.com. Uh, there is also, you know, if you are a current Redshift user, you know, you can subscribe to this link about new capabilities that we launch uh, in Redshift to get easy access to them. There is a business value white paper where, you know, we have featured more customer stories. Uh, so definitely encourage you to, uh, you know, take a look at these assets. Also talk to your account teams, you know, in terms of you're looking to, you know, leverage any of the new Redshift features or, you know, um, take advantage of other capabilities. Um, there are, you know, a couple of uh, assets available here at the summit for you to learn more about AWS technologies. And with that, uh, we thank you for coming and let's open it up to a few questions. You want to take? Okay, sorry. So, what's your daily ETO load uh, uh, volume? It's uh, around 1.10 uh, terabytes, I guess. Um, but if it is removing all the reprocessing aspects of it, um, it comes down. But the raw data and which we have to crunch and generate the insights, it's around 10 terabytes. Our more uh, heavy loads are the clickstream data which is, comes from all different sources, and uh, especially uh, two days back, <laughs> our tax season clickstream data is very huge. It's like around 400 to 600 terabytes range. Uh, that's our peak day. Good. So um, I had two quick questions. One is that you are integrating into Kafka. Uh, your streaming data is published into topics, I suppose, somehow. And you said then thereafter it's no code for ETL? Yes. Could you actually describe like what's going on so you have no code? Yeah, thank you for asking. This is a really interesting question. Um, our Kafka topics are um, basically streamed. All the data, uh, whatever it is going to a Kafka topics is being also being stored into a an S3 top S3 bucket seamlessly. There is a Kafka S3 integration there. Our uh, messaging infrastructure is already set up for that. Once we create a topic, it automatically uh, uh, synchronizes all the messages in the Kafka topic to be real time updated into an S3 bucket. Now our Redshift uh, inside the Redshift, these are enabled uh, seamlessly. If once we create the um, survey tables, it is a JSON object inside the S3 object, S3. S3. Uh, these survey tables can easily accessible through Redshift Spectrum. Okay, can I ask another quick one? Uh, Honeycode and graph databases, I'm sorry, uh, just let me ask about graph data. So do you have any sparse data or do you only have dense data? Uh, have you considered looking at Neptune or other graph database, and could you could you say what you are looking at in that direction? Uh, we have graph databases for uh, customer 360 and a uh, couple of risk and fraud related activities. Um, that being uh, used for uh, uh, real time risk, manage the real time risk, and then make sure that better provide the customer services like customer 360 aspects of it. That data is eventually turned into a, a Redshift for the analytics purposes, but the majority of the sources, applications directly consume from those graph databases. All right, and we have time for one last question. Any more questions? Yes. Yes, uh, it, it, it's probably not feasible to discuss this in just one minute, but um, I'm, you talked at the beginning about um, uh, scalability of the volume of data, and I'm also interested in understanding what you guys' experience or recommendation is around scalability of, uh, or ability to continue to understand your data and visualize it and 
and share it with other users, like document it basically as, as it grows in, in just, not just in volume, but also in complexity. How do you manage that complexity and document it? Uh, is there things to recommend? Sure. You want to take it? Okay, so um, we are, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, we have uh, documentation and data lineage is a big thing at uh, Intuit. We have something called a data map inside and uh, it's uh, again a kind of a, a graph database. And But what we have done is at the time of when we are creating these data objects, it is a code itself. And then when in the in the code, we document these tables and this is accessible to some other third party tools uh, seamlessly. At the same time, um, the second part of your question, I forgot um, about uh, lineage. How do you complete the, the, how do we, uh, different data is most, how do we, do, the data lineage are automatically integrated with ETL servers. So when we write a query to insert into a table, the lineage is captured systematically. Thank you. Somewhat related to this, even if it doesn't sound like it, is app, is there a plan to integrate AppSync uh, and Redshift, or is it already done and I don't know about it? Uh, we can talk about it offline, but like, you know, from an AWS perspective, you know, across our AWS analytics portfolio, we have other services like QuickSight as well, you know, which, where you, where you have like, you know, machine learning capabilities and natural language processing and things like that. So you can also have like, you know, similar to what Ravi was talking about, like, you know, more documentation and, you know, ease of use capabilities around users as well. All right, we are at time. So thanks a lot again for coming. And, you know, Ravi and I will be here um, outside the room. So if you have que more questions for us, definitely feel free to stop by. Thank you.